Can everybody hear me? Uh, just to feel a little bit the audience, who here is in offensive security, mostly penetration testing and RIT teaming? Raise your hand. Uh, defensive people, raise your hand. Okay, and management, I guess, the rest. Um, well, basically, we're going to talk about C2 environment, so it's command and control. Um, well, protect yourself against coronavirus, one way to look at it. Uh, so in essence, we're going to talk about C2 systems, uh, what are the building blocks, what are standard, let's say, or basic C2 environments, advanced C2 environments, and something what I call next-gen environment, which is my customized environment for C2 um, systems. So what are the building blocks of a command and control environment? You can see that basically it's a C2 server that has its own communication protocols. They execute commands on infected hosts and obtain data and results from these uh, commands. Then we have the agents and the implants Basically, these are running on your infected hosts, and they have several modules from persistence to other, let's say, capabilities. Um, but the most important one that they need to have is to avoid detection and how they communicate towards the C2 environment. Then we have gateways and redirectors. Basically, in an environment, if we compromise an environment, we do not want to have so many C2 agents phoning back into the C2 server because this will lead to easier detection um, of your uh, agents or your C2 environment. Ah, sorry. Is that right? Okay, so um, when we talk about persistence, we need to know how to persist and when to persist. So. Uh, how can a binary persist in your environment? Is used through registry keys, Windows servers. Um, you can do, use library injections like DLL or Python libraries or .NET libraries if you're using some uh, libraries in your code or in your app. You can inject yourself in the firmware, but also you can use Word templates, Excel, macros, and so on and so forth. And one important thing is communications. So how do these agents communicate back to your C2 environment, how they communicate with the gateway, or how they communicate with each other. So, the moment we have persistence, we're actually leaving breadcrumbs for the vendors to detect us. So, even the blue teams, the vendors, so anybody that's basically protecting or investigating, you will leave uh, breadcrumbs. So, how do we deal with it? We use obfuscation and encoding to protect our binary or our persistence or our agent. So, this reduces the chances of us being detected by typical endpoint systems. So, let's see how a basic C2 environment looks like. You can spin it in a matter of minutes. So, basically, you can script it yourself. Requires one C2 server which can be deployed in the cloud or in your own environment, where your agents will call back to, and you're ready to go. So there are multiple things that you need to do. You need to find out, let's say, an appropriate C2 environment. In this case, you can use Covenant. Um, there's a really good example by a very good friend of mine, Federico. He wrote his um, impressions of this C2 environment in Hack the Box environment for, for uh, Offshore and Resta Labs. So have a look at it. It's really good to see how uh, this system works and how you can move laterally using these implants. So the basic, how it looks like, this is you as the C C2 owner. You're issuing commands to your C2 server that sends down the commands to the infected host, and the infected hosts return the information back to the C2 environment. Very simple. So the problems here is that your C2 is directly exposed to the internet and it's easy to develop IOCs because you have one source address and basically it can be blocked on the firewall or the, the vendor can develop uh, threat intelligence based on the IP communication protocol and so on. So now we're going to look at a common infrastructure what most of us are actually using. So you have your C2 server, you have a server for payload delivery, you have your phishing server, 
that are not exposed to the internet. So what we are doing in this case, we are using redirectors to filter the traffic and send it back to the C2 environment. It's a much more effective way. In this case, in case one of these redirectors get compromised, you can actually spin it up in a cloud environment somewhere else. So you can use Azure, AWS, uh, Linode, and so on and so forth. So the redirectors basically prevent direct access to our environment. So as I said, everything is happening here. We have our phishing server. Basically, we need to trick the user into clicking on our payload, for example. We use web servers to deliver this payload. You can use a web server, FTP, whatever not. And most commonly, C2 traffic and data exfiltration traffic is over HTTP or DNS protocol. Pretty standard. So for redirectors, you can use Nginx, Apache, HAProxy, phishing, you have GoFish, Kingfisher, and so on and so forth. Payload delivery, again, HTTP, FTP, DNS, and various C2 platforms. So what are the challenges here and the benefits of using such an environment? You can, again, deploy it in minutes. You can adjust your threat vectors in minutes again. Um, you need to write your own redirection rules. So basically, you need to know how your C2 environment works. Once C2 traffic reaches your redirector, you need to go back and sell, send it to the C2 environment. If there is a payload delivery, you need to redirect the traffic to the payload delivery and so on. So core infrastructure is never directly exposed. This is good. We can migrate, as I said initially, the, the, the redirectors anywhere we want. It requires system admin maintenance work and stuff like that. So basically, you need to maintain the log files. You need to maintain your binaries. Every time you create a new agent, you need to publish it manually, so on and so forth. So basically, it is a lot of work. You cannot avoid customization. So this is something what Haroon said uh, initially. You need to be good at coding to be successful in your red teaming engagement or in your penetration testing. Because if you're using publicly available exploits and tools, there are already signatures developed for it. So you need to know a way how to bypass and customize your own code in order to get code execution or bypass any uh, EDR systems. So, and one important thing, so once you have all of these items working together, you don't have a centralized environment to see what is really happening. So if somebody's clicking on your uh, phishing link, you need to go to the web server, search through the logs. If somebody's working on the C2 environment, you need to go to the C2 server and get the log files and so on and so forth. So it's very difficult to correlate. So as I said, communication is the key. Um, so how do the infected hosts communicate with the C2 infrastructure? As I said, DNS, FTP, HTTP, you name it. You need to know how the infrastructure you're targeting is segmented. So basically, are there multiple networks? Is it a single network? Are there any firewalls there? What are the protocols allowed between these uh, subnets? So for example, most companies do not even segment their network properly. They allow anything to their firewalls between the client and the server environment. At the end, you will find other companies that actually filter properly between the client network and the server network. You need to know, are there any proxies in the network deployed? So basically, is the traffic inspected by HTTP proxy, by a DNS proxy, and so on? What are the other things to look out for, like SIEM systems? Are there any logging? Is there any logging? Um, is there any endpoint system deployed on the machine? And things like that. So I'll walk you through a scenario. So we are in Team Plankton. I apologize, I'm a very big SpongeBob fan. Um, we are looking for the Krabby Patty formula, the burger. It's located on the application server. SpongeBob is protecting it. And only thing you need to assume is we compromise the host. So scenario number one, the firewall is blocking all inbound connection, but everything outbound is allowed. So basically, we can use any protocol to send data outside to the C2 environment. Also, we can use any protocol internally as there is no filtering between the client and the server network. 
you will not find this very often, but there are scenarios like this, and you can actually use anything you want in this type of an environment. That's why I didn't put any uh, communication flows. So we have the second scenario, basically where the firewall is blocking everything inbound, but it's also doing outbound filtering. So what do I mean by outbound fil fil filtering? The servers don't have direct access to the network, and you have to move laterally to a infected host. So in this case, we're going to use HTTPS to communicate back to the C2 environment. And we can use any protocol internally in the network. So again, they will adjust their security. They will upgrade the infrastructure. And we need to do a different way of communication and data exfiltration. So again, we have a firewall. Everything is, again, segmented and protected. Only specific traffic can go between the server environment and the client environment. So in this case, we can use SMB to move laterally to the infrastructure. So again, we're going to use HTTPS to communicate back to a single host. And in this case, we use SMB to move laterally because you need to allow SMB in an Active Directory environment. So your clients need to communicate to the Active Directory server or to the file server. Basically, SMB is allowed. The fourth scenario is when we have a firewall that also does web filtering or HTTP inspection or HTTPS. So in this case, we fall back only to DNS and everything else stays the same. So now the incident response team deploys a DNS proxy. So in this case, we basically cannot communicate anymore because we've been detected and everything stops. Well, we still need to access the Krabby Patty formula and the burger, of course. So now we are going into building the next gen C2 environment. So what does next gen mean? Basically, we need to know the environment we are targeting. You need to know your target, and you need to know what they have in their environment. But also, you need to keep track of the blue team's activities. So we will speak about it. But also, you need to know your limitations and how to solve it. So this means you need to be good at coding. You need to know what you're doing. So the first step is to develop deception capabilities and offensive threat intelligence. So what do I mean by it? Everything will come to your redirector, so you will have a lot of data. So this means botnets will access, blue teams will access your infrastructure. There will be normal traffic, C2 traffic. Security vendors will access it. Malicious users will access it. Basically everyone. So anyone can download your code. So what do we do? Basically, we develop an Nginx module, so I mean I developed an Nginx module, that accommodates me to serve the right content to the right target. So what does this mean? Basically, I can serve content, false content to everyone except my own target. So my own target will see the malicious code. This means I can redirect content from security providers and give them a welcome page or a landing page while my client will download the original in payload. One other thing is we connect to threat intelligence sources. So what do we do with these threat intelligence sources is basically as every binary that you are going to send and all of your indicators are compromised from IP addresses, DNS names, and everything else, you can query I this data with external partners. So you can use your hashes, IP addresses, fully qualified doma domain names. And you can enrich your own data. So what do I mean enrich your own data? So as everything, again, is coming to your um, redirectors, you can basically use Shodan to query the source IP address, what it is. You can use gray noise, virus total, OTX, Talos, IBM, X-Force, and so on and so forth. It's a very, very interesting concept. So what does this mean? Basically, in the module itself, I will tell you what I'm doing here. All of my fake content is on this server in my environment. I'm raising an alert every time Raytheon or Forcepoint tries to access my environment. So these AS numbers belong to Raytheon. So I know my client is using, let's say, Raytheon DLP and Raytheon firewalls. And I'm raising a separate, let's say, alert for another host. So what, what's the next thing I do? I define my customer, 
I define the payload server for this specific customer and the IP address or network range of the customer. So this means that I will allow my customer, in this case my target, to access the real payload content, but if the same link is used by anybody else, it gets re redirected to another server here. Espe specifically, I want to target Raytheon, because if Raytheon starts accessing my data, that means that the blue team is onto me and that they're trying to basically capture our malware. So very simple. We also work on the working hours of the client. So basically we know they work from 8.30 until 5.30 in UTC minus eight time zone. So we know at what time the client is working, anything happening outside this working hour will mean that they're trying to, either they're doing overtime, but mostly maybe they're going to reverse engineer our malware or our agent. Quite interesting. So what do I mean by it? So if we open the URL, the customer A will see the payload, so this is a simple PowerShell script. But what will the other see is the same URL that will look into Nginx or welcome page of whatever you want. It's very, very useful to filter out and not allow your client or the blue team to get the hold of your payload. So what can we do? We deceive blue teams for a very long time. So any time a blue team tries to access your resource, you're actually deceiving them. They don't see the real content. We can filter based on IP address, network range, ASN number, and so on. So basically also we can use browsers, time of day, and we have one-time download links. So how does this look? We have an alert. Somebody detected our IOC on OTX, what is the agent, client, and what is the hash file. So I blurred it out so you don't see the actual hash file. So also we have another visualization in ELK, which means I can track your activity, history, which IOCs you've detected, and which phishing links have been clicked on. Again, we always query external data sources, so this allows us to basically track the blue team. If they try to reuse authentication key, so our agents communicate with authentication key, and they only use it once. So if there is a reuse, we will actually see it. So this means, again, that they're trying to reverse engineer our malware. And everything else is very well known already, I said it, so I'll just have to speed up a little bit. What do I mean by reuse of keys? So we can see again an alert, authentication, key, reuse detected, which agent, source, and so on and so forth. So we can see the AS number, the geographical coordinates, and the IP address for this specific um, detection. Second thing is we modify the agents to communicate and blend in. So what do I mean by that? The C2 framework is optimized to use DNS, and social media and cloud services. So basically we use applications that you use in your corporations like Slack, Microsoft Teams, Skype for Business, Twitter, we transfer, you name it. And we modify the initial stager to detect certain items in the environment. So when the stager comes in, it queries if we need persistence or not, or do we need access to that host or not. So this happens basically whenever the persistence is triggered, and it's triggered by either a macro service or whatever. So it's done by, based on an activity. So what do we do? We grab the OS type, patch level, security software, and security settings of this endpoint, and we use, we detect a lot of forensic, forensic tools as well. So what do we do? We generate the grunt, so this is Covenant platform and we have specific agents for Slack, Teams, Dropbox, social media, and so on. So we will generate a grunt that will utilize public services to avoid detection. So here you can see an agent using Slack and going to the Slack URL. It's very, very helpful. So we never keep the code on the affected host, so that basically means we only keep the small persistence file. We have one-time download codes, we query if we need access, and if we don't, basically it rests until 
it's called next time. The most important thing is to have self-destruct embedded in the environment. So what do I mean by self-destruct? We will talk about it in a second. Payload for every host is different. And this means that we can easily track which host you're trying to investigate, which malware type you're trying to investigate, which agent, which persistence, and so on. So we have another alert in ELK. So here is red line. So what does the agent do? It tells us here, I've detected memory forensic tool. I'm wiping out the data. And basically, it raises an alert in ELK. We get alerted about it. So we know they're trying to investigate this host. And we do it for basically a lot of tools, from redline, volatility. We basically know everything in this case. We have a highly customized DNS server. Um, basically, it uses the same rules as we define in our redirectors and our deception. We use it to communicate one-time download keys. And you can see it here. So what do we do? We just define that the deception is true. We have the settings that you will serve these fake entries to, to the subnets we wanted to serve. The real entries and the real servers, the C2 servers, will be here behind. So basically, again, if anyone is trying to access our name servers, they will see fake entries, so we can serve whatever we want to serve. And to the intended user, to the intended agent, we will serve the real content. What is the backbone of this? Elastic Stack. So we use all of these tools. So every single tool is basically sending log files to a centralized system. So think of it as a seam for red teams. OK? So all data from C2 systems, phishing, redirectors, everything is stored, correlated. We enrich everything by using threat intelligence from all the vendors. So basically, we have paid subscriptions. But we enrich the data. Why do we do it? It's easier to generate documentation for your client engagement. So I don't need to think about who moved laterally when. What was the keystroke? What was the password entered by the user? Where is this stored? Uh, all the screenshots are present there. So basically, you have a complete history, who has done what in the environment. And I'll just walk you through a quick engagement with what, what, what is the scenario. Uh, we targeted a software development company, so their management wanted us to test their systems. It was a black box engagement and a long-term operation. So what we've done is we surveyed the environment for about three weeks, and we stayed five months undetected in their infrastructure. What did we do? Basically, we used open source intelligence. We gathered enough data about our target using LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Reddit, GitHub, and so on. We found some interesting, let's say, posts. And we obtained code execution in a way that we sent them through the forum, basically a fix for their problem. So we fixed their .NET issue, .NET library issue, but we introduced a callback. So we surveyed the host. We deployed custom payload. We surveyed everything else in the network, their behavior. We moved laterally, and we got to the corporate data and the source code what was hosted on their environment. So this is basically how it looks like. So what we did we use? We used Slack to send C2 information outside. So Slack is allowed on their layer 7 firewall. You can move through it easily. We used SMB to access the backend data center. And we extracted the data out. They didn't see anything irregular in their environment. So we didn't use a custom HTTP page or custom protocol. We actually used a protocol that was allowed in their network and an application that was allowed in their network. We could have done similarly with Teams, with Skype for Business, SharePoint, OneDrive, you name it. And throughout every engagement, throughout every move, we actually monitored the threat intelligence. So did they upload anything to, uh, to uh, Wireless Total? Did they upload anything to IBM? Has IBM accessed our website? Or has any other vendor basically accessed the, the redirectors or accessed our content? 
So at the end, we had long-term persistence for about five months. What did the blue team see or the security provider? Nothing. Everything was normal for them. We served them deception data, fake content, false DNS responses, false HTTPS data. They did not know what was there. So basically, throughout five months of engagement, we deceived everybody in the environment, and there was nothing they could do about it. So what are the lessons learned? Things are not always shiny, so you will find various different things. So everybody uses different security tools. You have to be careful how you open files that you find. So as uh, Haroon previously stated, if you open a file, let's say a Word document, he has embedded canaries, he can see. So if we use uh, contain containers or isolated information or sandboxes to open this content, you cannot see it. Getting to know the customer IP is a painful process uh, for several reasons. What if they're using cloud-based DNS servers? What if they use cloud-based web proxies? Okay, basically my time is out, but can I continue? Three more minutes. Three more minutes, excellent. So there are ways to detect the real IP address of your client, but it can be a painful process. Always have one agent to communicate back to the infrastructure, because if we run multiple C2 agents and they call back, basically the firewall will pick it up, the blue team will get alerted, and you won't do anything after that. We had quite an interesting time, basically identifying security vendors, not only by the AES or a IP prefix, but also if they're using any cloud services or, or other addresses, basically, uh, to investigate a security threat. So it was deeply disturbing to identify certain vendors. Developers are easy targets. They always need special rights. So basically, they're always coding. They're always compiling. Uh, they need debugging permissions. They need to execute a lot of binaries. And they use a lot of libraries, basically sometimes even from unverified sources. And most importantly, as I said, you need to code, and you need to learn how to adapt and solve puzzles. So you will not be successful unless you can adapt to the environment. What can we say about blue teams? You, you can get deceived for a very long time. You will not even know about it. Look for deviations in your traffic. So basically, if you see an increase in SMB traffic from a host and in the application for, let's say, in our case, it was Slack, this should have been your indicator that something is wrong in the network. Always micro-segment. So filter out all unwanted traffic everywhere in your network. Work with your developers in the company. In, in this case, raise awareness for using libraries. Uh, you can find research on this topic as well. Uh, Red Elk is an excellent concept. Any questions? 